No, not at all. Far from it. Uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the pedagogy I dream of is one that combines the best of everything we have available to us. And that's why we've got to be very careful not to get trapped in a sense that there's an either-or version here, you know, that we have to dump that in order to achieve that. No, no, uh, I this feel that, uh, for example, I, I gave a, a speech recently to, it was just a wonderful moment of, of luck, to the Welsh, all the Welsh head teachers. Uh, and so happened the world, the education minister for Wales was, was there. And um, there was an apron stage, and I was able to, to walk down almost into the, sta- the, 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 the middle of the hall, if you like. And I had my, happened to have my iPad with me. And there was a question about, not dissimilar from yours, uh, about um, what I'd been saying. And I conjured up this image, if you like. I said to them, and I mean it, I said, you, until you all, these are head teachers, until all of you come to realise that this device is as fundamental to the development of your students as the slate on which David Lloyd George learnt to write his name. Until you come to terms with that, you will not understand where education is or where it's going. And I feel that very strongly. This is an extraordinary tool, extraordinary tool. And it is, effectively, it is the slate. It is the 19th century slate redesigned. Um, but the idea that this obviates that, or this room, is, is no, quite, quite wrong. What I would like to say, and we talked about this on, on the way over, what I would like to know is that, uh, for example, um, uh, a, a politics class could, f- could, could come in here at six o'clock in the evening and flip a switch and have a conversation with Noam Chomsky in his home. That I do believe we should be able to do, and that would be a really, really fantastic use of these type of spaces. So the, the ability of um, learning to, to actually just well, defy time, space and distance is, uh, is, is presented to us. And to not take advantage of that is, is, is bonkers. Uh, but, I, and, and th- but the notion that that discussion then turns into, he then comes off the screen, there's then a discussion led by someone here about the relevance of what he has to say to Ireland. And I'm, I'm obviously I'm using political, I'm keeping this within a political frame at the moment, but try to imagine this would be absolutely true of history, language, Anything else, Frank, you want to do? So we've got to get used to environments like this being used in order to access the world of learning. We talk about the world of learning, don't we? I mean, we all of us talk about the world of learning. And yet we somehow then allow the world of learning to get trapped between the pages of a book. Now, I'm a great book person. Why? Because the way I was brought up, I'm 70 years old, I was brought up to read books and annotate. I'm the world's greatest. Any poor sod that gets hold of books that I've had has got a lot of trouble because they are annotated to death. And that's the way I work. But I don't for one moment think that my grandchildren are going to work this way. And neither would I expect them. And neither would I think that they were somehow semi, semi-literate or, uh, or ill-educated if they chose not to, because they have that. Uh, and in a sense, that can do things that can't. Um, so now I'm, I'm very, very interested in the, the, whole, the whole mix of, of, uh, of what evolves. And that's when I, when I, when I talk about pedagogy. I'm talking about a, a, a really virile pedagogy that looks right across the spectrum of what's possible and takes the very best bits and applies them to each, in each subject area in the way that uh, the best teachers you can let, get your hands on are prepared to, uh, to uh, adjust to and, and collaborate with. Is that an, I hope that's an answer. Yeah, just one other thing. Yeah. I don't use stock myself. But I could ask, I I, you'll notice I very deliberately said there was a problem in England, uh, in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with them. I'm with them. Uh, now, here I've got to declare an, a, a, an interest. I'm a, a non-executive director of Promethean who make interactive whiteboards. I mean, the, the notion of not using an interactive whiteboard, if you've got a chance to use an interactive whiteboard, is to me daft. Um, but again, the problem there is uh, affordability. It isn't just the affordability of the, of the whiteboard. It's, if, it's the skills and training for the teacher to feel confident and use the whiteboard. Interesting enough, we were saying again on the way over, very, very seldom do I hear people say that the problem is the technology. The problem is not the technology. The problem is our ability to use and utilise the range of what the technology offers. You know, I pick up my iPad again. I use maybe 10% 
of the capacity of this instrument to help me. I literally cruise around, I've got plenty of apps because I'm interested in what the apps do. But do I, you know, I, there's two or th I use about four of these apps all the time, a couple of others some of the time, and the other 50 because I like looking at them. Um, and I'm intrigued by them. So, uh, no, I think the notion of the, the, the notion of, it's all about interactivity. The most exciting development I've seen in, in, te in teaching and learning in the 15 years that I've been very involved with it was almost exclusively been in primary, and it's a very important development, and I want to stress it, because it's, a, it's several sorts of breakthrough. When I was at school, the worst thing a teacher could do, because they thought it was losing control of the class, is allow the impression that anyone in the class knew more about the subject than they did. That would be, that was lethal, because that was, the, that was a short route to anarchy, okay? I now see teachers, mostly in primary, admittedly, in primary, go out of their way to say, Johnny, to a six-year-old, you're so much better at this than me. Would you mind coming up and helping me with this? All right? Little Johnny topples up, and sure enough, you do it. Now, what I've learned to do, what, don't look at Johnny and the teacher, look at the other kids watching Johnny. Because if Johnny can do it, they have no excuse not to be able to do it. The teacher can do it and they can't. That's what that happens. Huh? So what, they, what teachers are learning to do is use the brightest, if you like, people in the class, or maybe in some cases what the rest of the people, the rest of the school, the class, think of the dumbest, if you like, to come up, show how it can be done, and then pretend that they didn't know how to do it. That is genius teaching for me. But it is, think about this, it is a total reversal of anything that was taught at teacher training college 30 years ago. That would have been losing control of the class and not dominating the, not dominating the learning process. So we are learning. These things are happening. But they're happening from the ground up. That's all right. I've got no problem with that. Uh, I'm not sure they're mainstreamed yet. You probably told me. Sorry, it's a very long answer to a perfectly good <laughs> question. Is there any age at which you would um, recommend uh, the introduction of um, information technology? And is there a threat to tactile, tactile development of the child? I would suggest uh, quite the opposite. Uh, at age, I'd recommend an adoption for. Uh, I watched my granddaughter during the summer, who's six, with this. She is more fluent at actually negotiating it than I am. I'm still quite clumsy. I, I tend to prod it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually nervous of it. Uh, she's not. She moves it around. She finds the things that she thinks are, are useful and gets on with it. And what I felt watched, and admittedly, we were quite careful about the applications we put on it for, and they're, they're here, is every single one of them is a learning app. Every one of them. It's either a drawing app, or a colouring app, or a maths app. Every single one of them is. But it's, an, it's not the way I was taught. It's the way that she's... And that's during the summer holiday. That was six weeks working with this. By the end of the six weeks, she was totally confident and familiar with that. So, uh, uh, age? Yeah, three or four. I was talking to a chap who's in the digital world the other day. We were at a conference. And I was rather proudly telling him this. And I wouldn't say he said this snottily, but he certainly wanted to make the point. He said, oh, my kid does that, and she's two and a half. <laughs> So uh, I was put very, very firmly in my place. So age, no. I think it's when, they're, when, they're, when they feel themselves to be ready. Uh, are there losses? This is why this book's very good. Are there net losses? Yes. Our job as educationists is to work out whether the net gains outweigh the net losses. And I think one of the problems that we have, I certainly speak for myself, of our generation, is we focus on the net losses because they're things we're rather good at. What we're not giving enough credit for is the things that they can do that we can't. And maybe we should focus more on what, on the, on the resources and the way in which young people are developing areas of knowledge and areas of expertise that are quite beyond most of us. I hope that's an answer. Um, I was interested in your um, comment here. Thank you. <laughs> um, your comment about digitising uh, standard practices. Um, are you referring to Paul Point here? And because um, I find certainly the vast majority of lectures are given by PowerPoint slides with bullet points one after another, and we seem to be trapped in that form of pedagogy here at the university. I think that, uh, well, this is my own view, I think PowerPoint is quite a lazy way of doing things. It's not bad as a kind of aid, either as an aid memoir for the lecturer. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, quite kind of, it's kind of useful having the stuff up there. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite lazy. I'm, um, I chair the advisory committee of the Times Educational Supplement, TES. So, and I find it one of the most interesting jobs I do because it allows me to be 
to, to get into and ask questions and get answers to things I would never be able to get hold of. Um, there are one and a half million regular users of the TES website. One and a half million. There are... Oh, okay, let me give an illustration, uh, because it's very fresh in my mind. A, a um, teaching assistant, who was also a special needs teaching assistant, in Newport, in Wales, has uploaded 248 lesson, lesson plan suggestions. None of them PowerPoint, interestingly, none of them. Those lesson plan suggestions have been downloaded by one and a half million teachers. One and a half million. In 200, uh, no, sorry, 148 different countries. Uh, and are estimated by us at the TES to have saved something like four million work, no, lesson hours of, 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 of taking the pressure off other, other teachers. Now, that is happening every day. You can go on the TES site today and you can go to your subject and you, and you can trawl through various things. What's interesting is very, very few of them are PowerPoint. They are actually ideas. They're teaching ideas. They're things that worked. And they're, I, what I find very, very refreshing is they're not pedagogical in the sense of saying, this, do this. They're saying, I found that in this situation, when I did this, I was getting better results and more attention, and the class seemed happier than when I did that. Now, I've felt for a long time, this is probably almost another discussion another day, but I've felt for a very, very long time, that the day the teaching profession sees itself as, um, uh, if you like, an app developers, see, them, see themselves as part and parcel of a continually evolving pedagogical process, the whole system will have self-corrected and, and will crack it. It is the problem, actually, is the opposite. The problem is it's still true, in 2011, it's still true, that many, many teachers believe that there is a way of doing it. In many cases, they're working with, uh, I don't want to, I'm going to say, the, I use the word, poor or inept head, head teachers, because there are some. There are also, just as there are some brilliant head teachers, they're working for poor teachers, head teachers, who are not demanding more of them or better of them or encourage them to do the things that they can do. I know actually some teachers who will not in the, in the staff room talk about how much time they spend surfing the web for lesson ideas and lesson plans because somehow it's, it's not the done thing. And yet here is an increasingly global, vital community of teachers who are sharing, really sharing, all their experiences and it's out there for anyone in the profession to take down, use, aggregate, or improve. This is the key. Take the idea, try it out in your class, discover that there's an improvement to it, put it back up. That's what brilliant learning, teaching and learning professions do. And that's, I believe we'll get there. That's why, ironically, I was very aware when I was talking, I sounded pessimistic. Oddly, I'm not. I'm frustrated. I believe things are taking much longer than they need. I think there are completely arbitrary and unnecessary obstacles to change uh, because uh, I believe, as Keynes did, that, you know, uh, you don't... That, remember the famous thing about there was no money to buy, to, to build houses after the war, and he said you don't build houses with, with money, you build houses with bricks. Mm. And he was right. Uh, and, and I am a, a great believer in that. So I do believe there'll be change, and my job really is just to try and encourage you here, myself at times, to experiment, to be wrong, try things. But know that if we go on as we are, we are moving ahead at a, at a pace which will, I'm afraid, cripple us because other countries are moving far faster, far more adroitly and far more intelligently. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the co-opening uh, discussion. I suppose one of the things we're very attached to in the university environment is the idea of a small, a relatively small graduate seminar where the learning is peer-to-peer, -peer, it's mutual, it's face-to-face, -face, and there's the immediacy of people hopping off each other and um, students exchanging ideas together and all of that, and that's what constitutes the learning experience. Do you think that that can be replicated in any way in an asynchronous online environment where people are logging on from other places, not necessarily in real time, or how does one capture that kind of mutuality of learning? It's a really great question, and the answer I'm going to give you is not really an answer, it's a it's a question I'm asking myself because I'm not quite sure uh, how we're going to crack this. I'm in the process of developing, with a lot of help from a consultancy here in Cork called Granite, um, a video conferencing facility for me. Okay? And what I'm doing, because I've been invited to by a number of universities uh, in different parts of the world, Singapore and Australia, interestingly, particularly, means some uh, rather odd 
evenings where I think see myself trudging, trudging across to my garage at three o'clock in the morning. But uh, anyway, that will come with the job. Um, to, 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 to talk, to, to give a master classes actually for, to, uh, to, to uh, MBA students, not, not, to, not just business students, but law, law students as well. I'll, I'll happily talk about that if anyone's interested. The point is this. When we were working out the economics of all of this, uh, we worked it out with the, the, I need 10 megs, which is a lot of broadband. It's a lot if you live in, broad, in, in, in Baltimore, believe me. Uh, and uh, because I'm streaming video, okay. Uh, and we got past most of those things, but it became a whole, you know, a whole area of pricing problems. And fascinatingly, I was able to make a pretty good deal on a point-to-point, -point, I'll explain what I mean in a sec, a point-to-point -point arrangement. That's to say, from me to a single point in Brisbane, in this particular case, was affordable. Then there was a separate price completely if it was point to me to multi-point. So, uh, well, what does that really mean? Well, what it turned out to mean was that the, the University of Brisbane, uh, of Griffiths University, were very keen indeed to offer the facility to their students to receive the, what I, my, my, my course either in the lecture, small lecture theatre, or if they wished, on here. Uh, we then discovered very, some very interesting stuff. Uh, they obviously, the people getting it up, uh, on here, lose the opportunity, at least for the time being, of interactivity, but at least they're able to listen. Whereas in the lecture theatre, it is truly interactive. I, I control the... What's fascinating, and for those who know this te technology, I control the camera in their lecture theatre. So when someone's asking a question, I can zoom in on you and, 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 and as it were, talk to you and then pull back out. Uh, but obviously not this. And, uh, but what's intrigued me, I'm making heavy weather of this, what intrigued me was that the university was very keen on point to multipoint. And in the end, we came up with a perfectly good solution, which is to the extent they want to do that, they pay the price to the, uh, to the broadband delivery company for the multi-point facility. And you know, the other point I want to make is, well, there are also different price points. If the person uh, receiving it wants to keep it for two weeks, they pay a certain amount. A month, they pay more. Or 90 days, if they really want to keep it around for the next uh, exam period. So that this whole interest, what interests me from, from this was, a new kind of economics relating, if you like, to, to education, is that different opportunities had different price points. Now, I suppose nothing new about that. In one sense, that's always been true. But um, come back to your central point, is the, you know, the small interactive, the, the small group. If I look at what's happening in the UK, it's already collapsed. I mean, even Oxford and Cambridge, there's, 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 there's very, very little of that. In fact, when I go to universities, I go to quite a lot. What I'm seeing increasingly is new lecture theatres being built, which instead of being for 80, 80 seats, are 200 seats. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't think, I'm not sure that's stoppable. I think the sheer economics of what's happening, and certainly in the UK, are making that inevitable. So that the experience that you're referring to, which certainly, I didn't go to university, but certainly when I was young, was the norm, has become very, very ab abnormal. Uh, and you're relying, for example, I, t I taught for a number of years at the London School of Economics. Uh, and if I'm critical, I got the feeling for a, a, that a great number of professors there were there who, and they taught rather reluctantly. They taught because it was part and parcel of what they kind of signed up to do, but they were there to do research. And, and more and more of the teaching was being done by research assistants. And what I uh, detected was that in the end of the day, they kind of preferred the big lecture theatre. They could turn up, they could, they could perform uh, once a month in some cases. They were still the professor, they were still at the LSE, they were still doing their research, they were still appearing on television and writing a book. Uh, but actually, their, their, their connection with what you just described was minimal. Is that, do you think that's fair? Or are you being... Change, but how much have we to the assessment to suit the change? 
I think it's, I mean, you've got right to the heart of all of this. If I wanted to have cheap uh, applause line uh, ten years ago, when I was working at the Department of Education, what I would trot out would be the fact that here we were trying to develop a late 20th century education system still straddle and still harnessed to a 19th century assessment process. And that would always get, not getting it this morning, but that would always get applause. Uh, uh, and I think, I think it was profoundly true. I had lunch the other day, I don't think he was just giving away any big secrets, with uh, Rory Quinn. And it's certainly very, very much in the forefront of his thinking, is how to crack this. He is determined, he put it to me, to, to get to the bottom of uh, improving the assessment process. But he made a really good point to me that I had, you know, it's wonderful, you l live and learn all the time, that I had never occurred to me. He said, especially as a community, like, a, a small country like Ireland with, with its communities, he said, I've got to escape from the possibility, or I've got to help the teachers and, and head teachers escape from the possibility that their assessment decisions are challenged in the supermarket on Saturday morning. He said, it's a very real problem. Now, to be honest, I had never really thought about that bit of it, uh, which is kind of very poor on my part. I've not thought, thought that through. And he said, it's t trying to work these two things out. Now, the truth is, we're back to, in a, in a sense, the technology, and I'm not suggesting for one moment technology is the whole answer. We have developed, or we, in the labs, have, have been developed any number of constant assessment processes tied to, if, you, if you're prepared to believe them, Tied, tied to uh, response, response, response equipment. Uh, it is absolutely possible now for a teacher. I, I was a kid. I had loathed school. Uh, I really did. And I was uh, uh, probably, I was taught quite early on that I was stupid and I decided to believe it. And in order to not, not show how stupid I was, I never asked any questions. So I'd sit at the back of the class hoping not to be noticed and hoping to get through another class where actually no one asked me, asked me anything. I, I, God forbid, I would never put my hand up. You know, that was sort of madness. Um, now, and I don't think that's an uncommon feature of a classroom, uh, of, of, of being in class. Today, it's not a problem. That teacher will know exactly how, whether I can answer the question, how long I've taken to answer it, and have I answered it more quickly than I did last week when she last dealt in that subject area. All that information is completely available to her on, in real time. So at the end of a day or at the end of a week, she, it normally is a she, will make, can make an assessment of how the class is doing, who's holding, who's being held back, and what bits of her class or what bits of her, her teaching didn't quite make it through. And this is a constant process, constant feedback process. She can, if she wishes, share that with the parents. She can pick up the phone on a Friday and say, it's been a bad week for Johnny. He was doing really, really well a few months ago and somehow he's slipping back. Is there anything happening at home? Is there a problem? Blah, blah. Now that, to me, that's 21st century learning. Uh, it's all out there. It has a cost attached to it. Uh, it has training attached to it. It has confidence attached to it. You know, you've got to believe in these systems. And I think one of the reasons that, uh, now I'm in a way flying another kite here, I think one of the reasons it hasn't been adopted as quickly as it might have been is an interesting one. I've chaired for a, a decade an organisation called Future Lab. Future Lab deals in theory, cutting-edge education research. And it's been a fairly frustrating process, and I'll explain why. We've had some brilliant people work for us, brilliant uh, education researchers, and they develop marvellous little models of the way in which the classroom could work, or concepts. And they'll then go out and trial those in one, two, maybe three schools. And the results come back, and they're really, really interesting. You then say to that education researcher, or that team, you know, I think we're really onto something here, what we now need to see is, how does it work at scale? What are we going to do when this great idea of yours goes into, in, in the UK, 27,000 uh, schools? What happens when it hits, hits, hits scale? And you see the cloud come over their eyes. They've no real interest in that. What they really want to do is they've got another really great idea. They want to do another little model with another three schools. And so what's happened is, tragically, and I'm talking absolutely about the UK experience, I'm not sure whether it's paralleled here. What's happened is, real development has failed to go to scale because the best of the people working on those developments are not really interested in scale. Why? why? Because scale involves compromise. The analogy for my old business, the movie business, is quite precise. Uh, I know any number of people who hid behind and would intellectually defend making tiny movies. They made tiny movies for people who they knew and who they could predictably know would actually like what they were doing, and that was fine. That's what, that's what they wanted to do. Because they knew if they wanted to take that idea and make it work with 
to 15 million people, as opposed to 150,000 people, uh, it meant compromise, make, making some judgments. And those compromises might become uncomfortable and they'd rather, frankly, rather not make them. And I, that's the way I see education research, in a, way, in a way, trapped. I remember very, very well doing The Killing Fields, really well. There were two movies we could make. We could have made a tiny, rigorously researched documentary that could have played and, I think, very powerfully told the story of Cambodia and what happened. And, uh, and, ooh, and I, I and everyone else, I think I may have destroyed the technology up here, uh, with, with water. How does it react to water? Anyone know? Um, but very, very powerfully told the story. We made the decision to make a feature film. That absolutely involves some compromises, uh, no question. But I think it was the right call, and I'm very proud of the film, and it was, the, I think, the right thing to do. But it's a, ty it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's a type of mind. I wanted to make a feature film. Someone else might have said, but by making that feature film, you're going to dilute, you'll dilute the truth of what happened in Cambodia and the United States involved in it. If you make a choice. And I'm afraid that I think the educational world, to an extent, has made that choice. The very, very best and the brightest have restricted themselves to models of educational improvement as opposed to mainstreaming them and things that can work right across the system and then pushing and using all their brains and all their influence to push those right across the system. I hope that's an answer. It's something I feel very strongly about. Just one minute and last question. Yeah, good afternoon. I just want to uh, address what you um, mentioned about curriculum studies. You mentioned your, your role in the development of curriculum studies. And, and the, the role that curriculum studies can potentially play in preventing something like the recent London riots. Um, my, my, my question would be sometimes um, in the development of the more social related syllabi in the curriculum, sometimes I think the experience of practicing teachers would be that there can be too much expected both of teachers and of the education system Absolutely. when it comes to things like the social programs. Yeah. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't think anyone would say that the teaching teachers or the education system on their own could prevent something like the London Rice. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the conversation I had with Clegg went like this. You know, he was quite defensive about uh, what his colleague, colleague Michael Gove was doing with the, with the UK curriculum. And I said, look, you don't have to go there. We already have in Britain a thing called extended schools. It was developed under Labour Party. It is an extra hour and a half in some schools, two hours in some, which was to accommodate the problem of kids going home to, that, to uh, houses that were no one, no one in. So it was a, it was a good, good idea and it still exists. What you then did with that extended time varied from school to school and from head, head teacher to head teacher. There was no great prescription. I said, if you're prepared to really both afford and work on the way in which you use that, that time, there's some very, very interesting uh, solutions come up. And I offered two. One is, I don't know if it works, I don't know if it's done in Ireland. Uh, I've several times done a, a thing called common purpose. Any of you know what common purpose is? Common Purpose is great. So it was founded by a woman called Julia Middleton many, many years ago. Uh, and what they do is you go into a town, it could be Skibbereen, and you get together the, as it were, the decision makers. So you get together the head of the guard, you get together the fire brigade, you get together the people who deal in civil society every day of their lives, and you then mix in influential parents from the school, uh, head, certainly head teachers, and you get them to discuss their common areas of concern. And you look for overlaps. You look for where the, the, the guard already have a concern that the, that the head teacher can address. And it works very well. And they, these are all-day sessions. There's no escape. Once you get in that room, you hammer out issues which are sometimes quite uncomfortable. And they would bring in people from the outside, like, like me, uh, to have, to have a, a, as it were, a different perspective. And I said, you know, you could build up. There's nothing magic about this. It doesn't cost you money. You can build on that. You just make absolutely sure that part and parcel of your citizenship curriculum is that the guard do come in once, twice a year, and talk about what they're seeing, trends they're seeing, problems they're seeing, to the kids. That the, that, so you, you get a kind of plurality of input from civil society. This is the point I'm trying to make rather torturously. Civil society enters the school and discusses its problems. The output you want is a very simple one. The output is you are not just a citizen of this country, you're not just a child at the school, you are, we are trying to develop you into a responsible, caring, useful member of society. These are the things that go with that. It's a two-way street. One of the jobs we've all got to do, we know this, we have got to ensure that a generation of young people emerge who understand that life is a two-way street. It is a series of responsibilities 
and is a series of entitlements, or a series of obligations, and a series of opportunities. That's what it is. And the whole purpose of citizenship, which is actually a crap word to use, of citizenship education, is to get to drive that home. One of the things that's hugely successful, believe it or not, is a thing we started called Film Club. Film Club is, uh, is, is using DVDs, uh, getting kids to sit down on bean bags, wherever it is, and running a movie once a week. Because if you choose the movie right, and I'll give you an illustration in a second, if you choose the movie right, it is amazing the discussions you can get going and how bright young people are. I use often uh, 12 Angry Men. Very, very useful. First of all, you think black and white film, you know, not glamour. They get it very quickly. You then ask them afterwards, well, who was right here? Well, of course, Henry Fonda. I mean, he's the person I'd like. Who would you like to be? I'd like to be Henry Fonda. Why do you want to be him? He's the one that stopped them going to the baseball game. He's the one that kept them in that room. He's the one. Oh, no, because and you suddenly get a discussion about justice and the complexity of justice and how difficult and time-consuming it is. And you'll be amazed how kids get hold of that and will discuss it. Now, to be absolutely honest, how many of us in this room have really, really done that? Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, I could, I'll list, they tend to be of a particular era, certainly Inherit the Wind. You can, get, you can use films, and the distributors, because they're old films, distributors don't mind at all. You've got no big rights problems here. You can use these films to stimulate fantastic discussions about what it is to be a human being, how bloody hard it is to be a human being, what extraordinary decisions you have to make, how tough it is growing up in 21st century Ireland. But you're able to illustrate this stuff get a discussion going and get them, as it were, to join civil society instead of seeing themselves outside of it. That's what I was trying to refer to. I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Okay. Sure. Of course. Um, we could have stayed here for another hour. I know you've got it. That's right. So, can I just say, I come along today as a member of the public, and I would very much like to thank the university for making the lecture open to us. And again, I think it's a very important thing to think of in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.